talk a little bit about looking for life in general. But in fact, I work at the SETI Institute, S-E-T-I. And because there's at least one person in the audience who had the acuity to ask, what does that mean? What does the acronym mean? It's search for extraterrestrial. <laughs> he admits to it. It's search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So this is more than just looking for life. There are a lot of people that look for life. Where I work at the SETI Institute, 95% of the scientists are looking for life, but they don't expect it to hold up its side of the conversation. They're looking for dumb life, you know, microbes on Mars, something like that, OK? So we're looking for intelligent life. I don't know why this thing is changing automatically, but maybe that's OK. All right. We used to think that there was life nearby. 100 years ago, most of you are probably not old enough to remember that. But it was thought that there was plenty of life in the solar system and even intelligent life. This is Percival Lowell. Some of you may recognize him. Any of you from Massachusetts will know the name Lowell because he came from a Boston Brahmin family, right? And uh, he was interested. I mean, he, you know, he had money. He didn't really have to take any job when he graduated. He could just you know, lie back and think of England or something. But in fact, he was interested in astronomy. And um, rather than trying to get you know, tenure at some third-rate university, he just built his own observatory. Now, he studied mathematics. He was said to have been the smartest student that Harvard ever had. Mind you, it's only Harvard. But so here he is at the modestly named Lowell Observatory on a night in 1914, actually. And, uh, no, it doesn't show anywhere. 1914, and in fact, he was trying to check out the Mars canals. Not in this photo. He was actually looking at Venus here, but it doesn't matter. The Martian canals. There weren't canals on Venus that he knew about. Martian canals, because those had been seen in the late 19th century, even the earlier part of the 19th century, by Italian astronomers. And he believed it. He saw it. He could see them. And in fact, here, here's some of his handiwork here. Um, he mapped 400 of these canals. There was obviously this vast hydraulic civilization just 35 million miles from downtown Atlanta. Okay? He wrote books about this. He was a good writer. He was an excellent speaker. And the public believed this. Now, there were very few astronomers who believed it at the time, because they would look through their telescopes, and they would not see the canals. But what Lowell said was, you know what your problem is? And I'm sure these people had many problems. But he said, your problem is you're not in Flagstaff, Arizona where the atmosphere is more stable, clearer uh, seeing, or better seeing, and so forth. I, I point out that in this photo, as you can see, in 1914, when this photo was made, uh, you would put on a suit to sit alone all night in a dark dome. And look at Venus. You don't do that anymore. And in fact, his wife, who was about 20 or 30 years younger than he was, Constance, uh, she didn't find this all that interesting. She stayed back in Boston. We don't have any photos of what she was doing in the evening, but not this, presumably. OK, so that's how people look for, the, for, for intelligent life in the universe back then. Uh, this is a kind of a modern photo of Mars. I don't know if you can see it, but here it is. And you can see this giant canal going across here. But of course, it's a natural feature. It's in the Mariner Valley. From one side to the other is, the, is more or less the distance from uh, Seattle to Atlanta. OK. So this is 200 times the area of the Grand Canyon. Any of you who are interested in a career in real estate may want to consider buying property here, because undoubtedly in another 100 years, it'll be a great tourist attraction. But of course, this is, this is naturally caused. The canals were not there. OK. Nonetheless, we continue to look for life on Mars. This is a NASA impression of the Curiosity rover. Not that the Curiosity rover is actually looking for life, but it's looking for places to look for life. And before this, there was. There were, was reconnaissance done to look for where we should look for looking for life. Anyhow, here it is. This is what it really looks like. Okay, and it's going up this mountain in the back, Mount Sharp. Now, you might wonder, well, why is it going to climb that mountain? It's not just because it's there, which might be a you know, good motivation in some cases, but not here. It's because it's got sedi clearly sedimentary rock. And uh, that means that if it can get to the bottom of the mountain, then it's looking at rock that's on the order of three or four billion years old. And then it goes up a little bit, and it's only 2 billion years, and 1 billion, and gets to the top. It's kind of contemporary rock. The idea is to find where to dig to look for fossilized microbes or something else like that. OK, so that's what's happening on Mars. There's lots of stuff happening on Mars. Mars remains everyone's favorite inhabited planet, uh, particularly so because there have been some things discovered recently that suggest maybe Mars really is a good candidate for life or maybe was a good candidate for life. There's been methane found in the atmosphere. Those of you who study chemistry know that methane is made out of ping pong balls and sticks. A little <laughs> CH4 here. Now, the thing about methane is it's, you know, it's an exhaust gas. 
of methanogenic bacteria. You know, bacteria, some bacteria can make methane. If you live next to a garbage dump, as I do, then you will know that, uh, that that's true. The other thing, however, is that so if you find methane on Mars, you might say there's bacteria under the ground. Two things about that. It's not the only way to make methane. You can also make it abiotically, which is to say with you know, just hot rock, really. Um, and the, 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 the second thing is that if you were to release some methane on the, into the atmosphere of Mars right, and wait 400 years, it would all be gone because of the ultraviolet light from the sun, which would break it all apart. So the question is, this methane seems to be real. It's got to be recent methane because it gets destroyed on timescales of only a few hundred years. And if it's recent methane, is it biology or is it geology? And the answer to that is we don't know yet. Here's just a map of some of the methane uh, found on Mars. So it's there. This was controversy maybe a year or two ago. We didn't know if the methane was for real. But it is for real. So the question is, what's making the methane? Here's something else interesting about Mars. I don't want to talk too much about Mars, but I am going to. All right. Here's a, this is a result from the Europeans. Uh, the Mars Express orbiters had some low-frequency radar. And it looked at this patch of Mars. Here's the South Pole over there, for those of you who are planning a weekend trip to Mars. At this area here, it found a reflection from the low-frequency radar. Now, the thing about low-frequency radar is that it'll actually penetrate the ground. It's very hard to look under the ground with radar because radar doesn't, doesn't penetrate the ground very well. And it certainly doesn't penetrate oceans very well. Ask the US Navy. It's very hard to find submarines because you can't just use radar. Anyhow, what they found was here's a radar reflection. And you see this layer here, very bright. It was getting a lot of radar back from something about a mile under the surface. And the question is, what do you think it is, Bob? Well, who knows what it is? Maybe somebody left a big aluminum plate down there. But more likely, it's water, because that would reflect the radar. Okay. And so the claim here, although it's, it's a tentative claim, the claim was that there's a big underground lake on Mars. And if that's true, that lake has probably been there for billions of years, or it could have been. So if life ever you know, began on Mars, that's maybe where to find it. So if you want to find life in the universe, and we haven't done that yet, but if you want to find any life in the universe, maybe your best strategy is to get, you know, I don't know, <laughs> get some drilling rig guys, you know, from Louisiana, take them to Mars and have them drill down there, okay, and, and suck up some of the water and look at it under a microscope. Okay, by the way, I, I might point out that if you type into Google, life on Mars, you'll find that many people have found life on Mars. Okay. And, and the way they do that is by looking through the rover photos and overanalyzing them. For example, uh, the, the, anybody been to Copenhagen? If you have, you, you know the lonely little mermaid. Yes. There's one guy in the audience. This is, this is, this is, this is kind of like the White House staff. They have an audience of one. All right. Um, for some reason, the Martians, when they were there, built this replica of the Lonely Little Mermaid statue in Copenhagen. There it is. Uh, it's only about you know, five centimeters high or something, but I don't know why they do that. There are other things like this. Here's a Nazi uh, helmet on Mars. <laughs> Apparently, the Wehrmacht went to Mars. Not many people know that. Um, but the, you know, the, the, check the web. You'll find lots of stuff. What else do we have? Oh, yeah, there was this. OK. <laughs> so clearly, these are all natural phenomena. Um, and we haven't found life on Mars yet. OK, maybe a better place to look for life uh, in the solar system, anyhow, might be this moon of uh, Saturn, Enceladus. This is a model of what we know about Enceladus, or think we know. In any case, it's, it's a small moon. It's not as big as our own moon, but it has this layer of liquid, of water, underneath the surface there, so a hidden ocean. And there's a lot, of, a lot of ice in the outer solar system. And some of it is squirting through the cracks there, making a, what you might call ice geyser, so shooting ice into space. In fact, here's a, uh, here's a photo made by the Cassini mission, I believe this is uh, Saturn. So it is a Cassini mission, and you can see these plumes of ice coming out through the cracks. Now, why is that interesting? This may be the easy way to find life. If there's life down there in that big body of water underneath, and there could be, you might say, oh, well, how is it making a living? I mean, there's no sun, right? So you can't do photosynthesis. But of course, there are chemical reactions that can, in fact, support life. If you go outside tonight and drill a mile deep hole here on the campus and pull up the muck at the bottom of that and look at that under a microscope, you'll find life. Right? And clearly, that's not living on photosynthesis. 
Right? So various reactions, mostly in, uh, in involving iron and stuff like that. So maybe the quickest way to find life in the solar system is just to send a flyby mission to uh, Enceladus and grab some of this stuff coming out of it and then bring that back to Earth and look at that. Okay. So there are people, I know some people at NASA Ames Research Center, I know some of you are familiar with NASA Ames Research Center, uh, who have decided Mars, it's okay, but it's so yesterday. They want to, in fact, go to Enceladus. That may be the quickest way to find life. And, and this is just a you know, little rogues gallery of other places in our solar system where you might have, well, almost certainly do have conditions for life. Doesn't mean there is life, but if you have the conditions for life, why not look? And these are all places you could reach with a rocket. So when you talk about looking for life beyond Earth, which is, NASA is very interested in, the public is very interested in, three of you are interested in it, if, you're, if that's what you want to do, these are the places you would go. However, if you do find biology, it's almost surely going to be microbial. right? So at the SETI Institute, 96% of the researchers are doing this kind of stuff, and 4% of them are looking for the kind of life that could hold up its side of the conversation, right? intelligent life. So that's what I'll talk about for the rest. So you can't look in our solar system, but there are plenty of other solar systems. This is a, uh, from a website that's uh, maintained by the University of Puerto Rico, and they, they keep a list of all the possibly habitable worlds. In fact, I think all the exoplanets, but these are the ones that they have on their front page as the leading candidates for being habitable planets. Now, you might say, well, what does it mean to be habitable? Well, you'd want to begin with maybe temperatures half of what they have in Atlanta. You know, you want liquid oceans, atmospheres, all that stuff, okay? And there's no, there's no knowledge about whether any of these worlds have that, but they could. They're the right size. They're at the right distance from their home stars, so the water doesn't all evaporate right away, doesn't all boil away, doesn't all freeze solid, anything like that. But, of course, the details you see in this rendering are, in fact, the work of imaginative artists. Don't have any, <laughs> there's no actual data in that. But, so there are a couple of dozen right here, and you might say, well, that's a lot of candidates. Well, it's not, right? I mean, keep in mind, if you're looking for life, if you were a Klingon, and you had a SETI experiments to look for life on Earth, you could have aimed antennas at Earth for four and a half billion years without ever picking up I Love Lucy or any other kind of entertainment, right? So the fact that you have a couple of dozen of these things Nice, interesting, but it isn't going to guarantee that you're going to find anything, even if intelligent life is very common. It depends on how long intelligent life lasts. If it lasts for a very long time, then the chances for any given world to have intelligence might be pretty, go uh, pretty good. But if life, as so many young people seem to think, once it gets intelligent, heads immediately to hell in a handbasket, and we're going to self-destruct within 20 years. I don't know why the millennials think this. Maybe they don't want to go to work. I don't know what it is. But <laughs> Well, whatever, if that's your point of view in life, then of course you're not going to find many candidates where there's intelligent life. Now, we could maybe up the, the chances a little bit by using the James Webb Space Telescope, assuming that it gets launched in some uh, reasonably near future, because it would be able to examine the atmospheres of some of these uh, nearby planets if they happen to be aligned correctly so they pass in front of their star. So, you know, what's in front of the star, the light you see is passing through Obviously, there's direct sunlight, but there's also the light that goes through the atmosphere, and then when it goes behind it, you know, you don't get that atmospheric contribution to the spectrum. So, in this case, you can subtract one from the other, and in principle, you could find maybe methane or oxygen in the atmosphere, right? In this room, 21% of the air was oxygen before you guys got here, right? Began using it all up. All right. Now, where did that oxygen come from? You know, well, it's always been here. Said, so, no, of course, it hasn't always been here. If you had visited the Earth three, four billion years ago, very little oxygen in the atmosphere. But there was a big oxidation event that began about two billion years ago, and it was because of the invention of photosynthesis. So, you know, if you find oxygen in somebody else's atmosphere, you can say, I don't know what it is, but there could be photosynthesis. So that's a good way to find cabbage in space, if that's your intention. Uh, methane, methane is, as suggested, produced by microbes. Also, there's methane in the atmosphere here, and a lot of it is due to what's politely called bovine flatulence or porcine flatulence. So if you found methane, you could say pigs in space. I mean, so this, this is all stuff that's going to happen in the next 10 years. So this is, these are the kinds of things where we point our antennas 
at star systems where we think they have worlds that have all these things that you know, we have here on Earth. In other words, we look for analogs to what we know. We look for analogs to life on Earth. We use this uh, set of antennas in the uh, Cascade Mountains of California. You might wonder why it's located there. This is about 300 miles north of San Francisco. I'm sure many of you are familiar with San Francisco. Personally, I have signed the petition to have San Francisco towed 10 miles out to sea and sunk. But I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, that, that feeling isn't universal. There are people who love San Francisco. So anyway. But this is, this is located here to avoid San Francisco, because with these Cascade Mountains here, they're all volcanic things, um, it blocks all the interference, all the radio noise from San Francisco, which has millions of people, of course. Anyhow, it's called the Allen Telescope Array. Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft Corporation, paid for the R&D and the construction of 42 of these things. The idea is to build hundreds. That's a money issue. I'm not going to talk to you about money because young people are totally oblivious to money. But uh, the, <laughs> that, will, <laughs> well, that will change. All right. What else? What am I doing here? OK. So this is Frank Drake. Um, he comes in every morning. He writes this equation on the board. We don't know what it means. But Frank Drake, <laughs> Frank Drake back in 1960, did the first modern SETI experiment. Okay. He used an antenna in West Virginia, not terribly far from here. And he pointed it over the course of a couple of weeks in the direction of two nearby stars, hoping to eavesdrop on signals from ET. Now, what kind of a signal was he looking for? Many people say, oh, well, uh, obviously you're looking for uh, prime numbers or maybe the Fibonacci series, or maybe the value of pi, right? Which would be, as I mentioned earlier this afternoon, if they sent the value of pi, I'd be really disappointed. Here's a society that's undoubtedly way ahead of ours, and they send me something that I learned in seventh grade. Okay, so it's probably not going to be the value of pi. But in any case, we're not sensitive to any of that. That's the message. What we try and do is simply find a narrow band component of the signal to tell us that they're on the air. Okay, all right. That's a technical thing, but he was doing that back in 1960 with a receiver that only picked up one channel, one frequency at a time, and he would turn the radio dial with a little motor. Uh, that's how he did it. Now, a question that Frank gets a lot, and actually all of us, um, was, okay, Dr. Drake, uh, you've been looking for ET, you haven't found him so far, uh, when are you going to find him? And when I first heard that, when I first came to the SETI Institute, uh, this was just before the Civil War broke out. When I first went there, and I would listen to what Frank said, and you know, I thought he was going to say, well, of course we don't know. But he didn't say that. He gave some number. We're going to find them within a few years, right? <laughs> and then I, I listened to when he asked Jill Tarter that, and she had some other number, and other, somebody else had another number. And I plotted up these numbers, and it turned out they correlated very well with the number of years until these people were going to retire, OK? <laughs> so it was all wishful thinking. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to see if I can do better than that. This is, a, this is a plot that shows the speed of SETI searches since Frank Drake's first experiment back in 1960. So it's some metric. Uh, it's actually related to the processing power of the computers being used. So how quickly we can look for this through this haystack of the cosmos looking for a needle. And as you can see, it's going up. And uh, for those of you who are conscious, uh, both of you, it's, you know, this is a semi-log plot, right, which means that it's going up exponentially, a word that the media now routinely abuses. Okay, so it follows what are called, what's called Moore's Law, and as I mentioned earlier today, Moore's Law simply says, this, is, this was an observation by Gordon Moore at the Intel Corporation back in the 1960s, that the number of, you know, gates you can get on a chip doubles every 18 months. Okay, that was true then, it's still true today, more or less. Okay. What that means is that you have to tr you know, trade in your computer every couple of years for a new one. Not because it's broken, not because it, is, it doesn't look just as shiny as it did the day you bought it, but because it's obsolete and it won't run the software that you try and use on it. Okay? So that's Moore's Law, and that's an economic law. That's because the companies in the Silicon Valley where I live know that your computer isn't going to wear out. It's not like a car, right? I mean, it isn't like the, the auto companies encourage the use of salt in streets where, where it snows. You know, we, we got to sell them new cars. No, here, they don't wear out. They're just sitting there on the floor of your office, right? They look just as good as they ever did. And they still work just as well as they ever did. Okay? But the, the idea is that 
they want to sell you a new one, so they keep making them faster and faster. Now, the benefit to us is that, well, faster and faster means we can look through the sky faster and faster. That's a technical story, which I will spare you. But it does mean that the SETI experiments being done today are equivalent to all the SETI experiments done up to this time, right, in terms of how many data points are collected. So it's like, OK, we're looking for a needle in a haystack. And we start out with a teaspoon. But two years later, we got a tablespoon. And then two years after that, we got a small shovel. And then, you know, and after 20 years, you have a skip loader, right? So that's why I have bet everybody a cup of coffee that we'll find ET within two dozen years, mainly because of this. Because within two dozen years, we will have looked at a million star systems. As of today, we've looked at thousands. We will look at three orders of magnitude more. Now, I'm going to talk to a little bit. I mean, this gets very speculative. But on the other hand, maybe that's refreshing after what you've just heard. OK, what would ET be like? Now, <laughs> this is what Hollywood thinks ET would be like. Uh, the, the only thing that I find in common between all the depictions of ET in the movies is that they always have a lot of mucus. I'm not quite sure why that is, but <laughs> digestive problems, something. OK, they always have a lot of mucus. Now, my, my colleagues are not very interested in what ET looks like, to be honest. You know, they say, well, I don't care what he looks like as long as he builds a transmitter that we can, we can pick up. And, uh, you know, that sounds right, but I think it's wrong. Because if you don't think a little bit about what ET might be like, you might look for the entirely wrong thing, OK? Um, we assume that ET is sort of like us, OK? I mean, maybe they're little gray guys with big eyeballs and no hair, no clothes, no names, no pets, no sense of humor. Maybe, maybe those are the guys you always see. But those guys look like you, right? And uh, they might not look like us. I, I don't care so much about that. But they may not be like us. It might not be that they're some sort of soft, squishy critter, and there are billions of them living on some planet, and they've got some technology, and they built some transmitters for whatever purpose. Um, the problem is this. Th these are the things we assume, but those are all the kinds of things you would assume. We assume that they're going to be more advanced than we are. And you, you might say, well, why? Why couldn't they be less advanced than we are? Well, of course they could be, but you're never going to hear from those guys. This is a very strong selection effect. Unless they're at least as advanced technologically as we are, they're not building a big transmitter. You're never going to hear from them, right? I mean, the Klingons out there might be you know, looking for signals coming from Earth. They're never going to find the Neanderthals. They never would have found them. The Neanderthals never did anything that was you know, obvious enough from 100 light years that they could have been found. So if we find anything, you can be sure they're more advanced than we are. And by the way, in the movies, the aliens always come to Earth, right? Because they're interested in flattening Los Angeles to begin with. Now, as a resident of Northern California, I really don't have any problem with that. But on the other hand, what? <laughs> although Margo's from Southern California, so she might. But uh, you know, that's a very expensive project. And what does it get them? Hey, we flattened Los Angeles. Well, that was worth 300 trillion galactic cruceros. Glad you did that. They're more advanced than we are technologically, yes. And that means that we imagine them as having all this high tech you know, stuff, and they can go very much faster than our rockets can and all that stuff. But we're still imagining that they're like us. Now, in the movies, we always defeat them, by the way. You might ask how realistic that is, but on the other hand. So if you really want to think, well, what are they really going to be like? Maybe you could just extrapolate what we think we're going to be like, say, 100,000 years from now or something. OK, here's your standard alien. These are the ones that the, the movies always use. And uh, a biologist from Emory, by the way, pointed out to me years ago that, well, Seth, you know who that is? And I said, sure, that's an alien. She said, no, no, that's a projection of what we think we are going to be like in 50,000, 100,000 years, right? I mean, you know, sure, I mean, he's got eyes. We've got, I mean, small noses. We're losing our olfactory sense. Small mouths, because we're losing our dentition. Right? Small stature, because these guys don't load trucks for a living. Right? I mean, judging from the eyes, which are the only thing to have gotten bigger, uh, you know, they're all designing websites. OK. <laughs> Maybe okay. Some, something that struck me when I look at this the other day, there's no, uh, you know, so there are no whites to their eyes. You know, there are critters that don't have whites to their eyes. You may say, well, who cares? But you do care. If you're a social critter, you need the whites to the eyes. So you can see where the, the guy next to you is looking. Is he looking at you? Is he looking at, you know, your mate, I mean, I don't know. What, is he going to grab that steak? What? So it's important, you know, I think, for social animals to have whites of the eyes. It's just a side. Probably wrong, but OK. All right, so this is what we think they're going to be like, but and, and you know, this is what they're going to be 
like in terms of their uh, characteristics. These are all the sorts of things you could expect, or at least most people do. This last one I think is important, appendages to wheel of soldering iron. Uh, the, the, the scientist from Emory who was telling me about the aliens actually studies dolphins, and she maintains that they're very, very clever. I don't doubt that. I don't, know any, I don't have any dolphin friends, so I don't know, but, and they don't write great books, I've got to tell you that, but, I mean, maybe they're clever. They have big brains relative to their bodies, but they have a hard time picking up a screwdriver, okay? And I think that that's important. If you can't use tools easily, then you're not going to build a radio transmitter. I mean, even leaving aside the fact that they mostly live underwater where, you know, radio waves don't even have an easy time getting through. So, anyhow, but these are the things we expect. Oh, stereo vision. Okay. That's what we expect. And this is the other thing we expect. This is a plot. I'm told never to show plots, so I'm showing these plots. Um, this is your brain size, right? The volume of your brain as a function of time. Long ago, today. All right, so that's three million years ago when your brain, not you personally, but you know, when, when brains were, um, this is our Australopithecus or whatever, you know, some ancestor of Homo sapiens, your brains weighed 500 grams. They weighed a pound. About a million years ago, your brain weighed two, two pounds. Today, your brain weighs three pounds. This is something you can verify for yourself, I suppose, if you weigh your brains in the morning. Okay. <laughs> and, and the assumption for ET is that this curve just keeps going up, you know, through the roof here, and that our descendants will have 10-pound brains. So ET will probably have a 10-pound brain. They often do in the movies. Okay. Now, you wouldn't really want a 10-pound brain. To begin with, I'm told the women would go on strike. I'm not giving birth to any baby who's going to have a 10-pound brain, right? <laughs> and, but beyond that, it would be mechanically very difficult. Right? You would twist your head to see if anybody's about to pass you on your bicycle, and you would just twist your head off, which would ruin your old day. So, 10-pound brains, I don't know, mechanically there are problems, but maybe, maybe you could do it. But that's what we assume. But, you know, what is it? See, if you have a two-pound brain, you're a forest ape. If you have a three-pound brain, you get, you get tenure here, right? It's only one pound difference. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know why I should slide. All right. Here's, here's an, an example. This is some guy who's thought about this. I forget his name even, but anyhow, some academic has thought about what we're going to look like. So this is another way into the question of what ET might look like. This is what you look like today, some of you. This is what you might look like 20,000 years from now. You might say there's not much difference, but there is some difference. The eyes have gotten bigger again. Foreheads have gotten bigger because, you know, they're better students. Uh, and then 50,000 years from now, right, nobody's black, nobody's white, everybody's something in, in between. The eyes keep getting bigger, foreheads keep getting higher. And 100,000 years from now. Might as, well, <laughs> might as well invest in foster grants or whatever. I mean, they're going to they're make money. All right, this is all, it's fun, but I, I think it just misses the whole mark. It's all too anthropocentric. It's just, again, assuming everything out there is going to be somewhat like us. Now, we like biology, particularly beginning in the eighth grade. You like biology, all right? But the troubles with biology in terms of being a, an intelligent being is that, A, it's complex. Biology is very complex. It's hard to deal with, right? Um, it's because it's bottom-up engineering. You know, you start with a single cell that can kind of reproduce accurately. Then you build something else, and then you build more single cells. And for, you know, billions of years, you build more single cells, and eventually you build multiple cell thingies. It's bottom-up engineered. It's not designed. It's not like the College of Engineering here, right, where you design, you know, I, want, I want a robot that can do this. You design it top-down. You don't make a very simple robot and then just wait for it to evolve into something, because that'll be bad engineering, okay? So, uh, and the proof of this is that we barely work. Now, I know you don't think that, but if you're 30 or older, you know that, right? <laughs> you barely work. Okay, that's good. Biology is okay, but it's really complex, unnecessarily complex. It's fragile, um, and, and, you know, it doesn't really improve very quickly. If you were to take Julius Caesar's kids, you know, um, he had at least one, and throw them into Georgia Tech, they would do just fine. I mean, at first they'd have to learn how to stop writing in Latin or whatever, but... You know, this. Okay, but you know, they're no stupider than we are. Right? So in 2,000 years, not, essentially nothing has changed in terms of you know, the, the raw material. Contrast that with Moore's Law, where if you have a laptop that's more than four years old, you're not getting any respect at parties. Okay? And also, of course, biology has a short lifetime. I mean, the whole model for existence here on Earth, I don't want to discourage you, but if you think about it, right? You know, you're born, for six years you have some fun, 
And then you have to go to school. And then for the next 20 years, you go to school and maybe occasionally have some fun. And then you get out into the workplace and you spend 40 years there, probably not having any fun. And then you retire, have a little fun for 10 years, and then they throw the whole system into the ground. That's terrible, right? You don't want to do that. This is all the wrong model. What you want is some other model. Now, here's the way to that other model. Here's your brain. <laughs> here's your brain. OK. Uh, I don't know why it says that, but that's interesting. Um, your brain, nobody, you know, nobody has a very good number for how many flops your brain runs out. You know, what's the speed of your brain in computer terms? But this is one estimate, 30 billion million instructions per second. All right, most of you are sitting here, you know, barely awake, half asleep, and yet you're still running at 30 million MIPS, right? Th that's not efficient to begin with, not productive, but it does, you know, means your liver keeps working. Okay, but 30, mi 30 million MIPS is pretty impressive, but there's already a, this, this computer in China, right? The Tiana 2, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, but, you know, it runs at that rate. Now, it's not as compact as what's in your skull, admittedly, but on the other hand, it's pretty general and doesn't require coffee breaks. So we already can build a machine that has the same processing power as your brain, okay? Uh, and you know about the applications. This is a fairly recent thing. You know that computers can beat anybody at chess. Uh, now they can beat anybody at poker. Um, now this is the machine that beats anybody at poker here. Fortunately, this has a hard time bellying up to the, the, uh, the 21 tables in Vegas. Um, because you could make a lot of money, but anyhow. All right, there's that. So this guy's out of work. Uh, obviously, the, the, this is <laughs> Kasparov, Gary Kasparov, back in 1996, when he lost to this IBM computer in chess. You can see he was not a happy camper. Actually, he said at the time, it was as if the computer had some sort of alien intelligence. Well, of course it didn't. It was just a game-playing computer. It was just following rules. It was very deterministic, but what it proves is that if you spend a lot of money, you can build a computer that can do a very specific thing better than any human, right? Of course, that's not what you want. You want generalized artificial intelligence. Yeah, I can win a Jeopardy. These are very good Jeopardy players here on either side, but you can see this guy in the middle is winning all the money, this guy in the middle being an IBM computer. Uh, also, Go. Go is a very complex game, uh, more complex than chess, and I think that this is, I don't know which one of these, I guess it's this guy. I'm not sure which one of these guys is the world champion Go player, but he didn't win. The computer beat him. Uh, Go is gone. All right, so where's all this going? Where, where it's going is shown in this uh, plot by Hans Morovich. He's a roboticist at Carnegie Mellon in lovely Pittsburgh. And what he did is plot up how much compute power you can buy for $1,000 as a function of time. Okay, so back in 1900, the computer you could buy for $1,000 was fairly limited in capability, all right? But, you know, he keeps getting better. And his, um, his plot stops in about 1997, the data run out here. Now, again, this is a semi-log plot, so it's going up exponentially. It's just Moore's Law. In 1997, for $1,000, you could buy a, compute, a computer that had the processing power of a lizard. I don't know if that's interesting to you. Might be if you're selling car insurance. Okay, so, <laughs> but the point is that by 2020, I mean, you know, these extrapolations are a little uncertain, but by 2020, your laptop will have the compute power of a human, right? There's very little doubt about that. That's gonna happen. Now, when I mentioned this uh, at the University of Washington years ago, some, some students said, well, as soon as you have a thinking laptop, isn't it going to kill us all? <laughs> and I thought, okay, natural optimism of youth, but, <laughs> But, but I, my, my, res, my rejoinder to this guy was to say, look, you know, I've got some goldfish at home, and uh, you know, I, I am smarter than those goldfish, but I don't wake up in the morning thinking think I'm going to kill those guys. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's dangerous at first, only because it may take your job. That's dangerous. It may be socially dangerous, but it isn't that the computers turn on us. But the point is, this isn't far away. You can believe this or you cannot believe this. Uh, I was uh, at Stanford, actually, a couple of years ago for some TV program, whatever it was, and the head of the AI department at Stanford was in the room. So in the breaks between the shoot, I went over to him, and he had his heads in his hands, and I, I said, so are we going to have a computer that can write the great American novel by 2050? And he looked up at me, and he said, yes. And he put his head back in his hands. I mean, 
That was his analysis of, of the problem. You can believe him or you can disbelieve him, but if this happens 150 years from now, 200 years from now, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. We are inventing our successors in this century. Okay? Now, the point is that that leads to this very simple time scale argument. Here's, you know, 1900, they invent radio. Suddenly these, these people are intelligent, they could get in touch. Within half a century, we already had computers. This was during the war, but these computers had the same architecture as computers do today. Less than half a century, right, after, after Marconi. And the, the suggestion here is that in another half century, or another 50 years, put it that way, we may have generalized artificial intelligence. It's unclear whether that'll really happen, but if you do doubt it, what if I said, okay, maybe by 2150, would you dispute that? I doubt that you would. At some point, you say, yeah, it's going to happen. Unless you think there's a miracle going on between your ears. Okay, some, some of you do. So the point is, if, we, if ET is out there, it's not going to be these guys. Right? It's going to be this guy. It's going to be some sort of synthetic intelligence. And the point is, once you have synthetic intelligence, it can improve very, very rapidly. All Darwin is so passe at that point because Darwin isn't necessarily going anywhere, it's slow. But the computers can, that's technology, can improve very, very rapidly. And that means you ask the computers to design their successors. And they're not all going to stay here. Now that's alien sociology, if you will, or com computer sociology. But I would think that the better computers would just want to bolt a rocket engine onto the back and go somewhere. Because as interesting as Georgia is, they want more energy, they want more materials to build maybe more circuitry. So whatever they do, they can do it faster. And this is not where the action is. The action may be, for example, in the centers of galaxies. Big black holes, right? You can get a lot of energy out of them. So maybe that's the, I mean, this is, you know, it's been good. It's been a good run for four billion years, biology. And it's not that it's going to go away, but it isn't going to be calling the shots. And the point is this changes everything about SETI because we keep looking for ET on some habitable planet somewhere. We keep looking at the list of exoplanets and say, well, here's a good place. Here's Earth 2.0. There's Earth 2.0. But if this is correct, if there's any truth in this, the real intelligence in the cosmos is not soft and squishy. It's not like you. It's some sort of machine. And so, you know, how can we find something like that? I don't know. I mean, you, you undoubtedly have better ideas uh, because they might not make much noise. I mean, I, I, you know, maybe they do. Maybe they don't. I don't know why they would. But they might not. And that means you might not pick up any signals. The only way to maybe investigate that is to consider, well, what sort of things might they do? What would interest a thinking machine? And uh, I don't know, but here are some suggestions. One, they could just play solitaire forever. They're going to play solitaire until the universe dies. I mean, I don't know. Is that interesting? <laughs> I, I think as a future career for myself, it might be interesting. But maybe the machines would get bored with that. Uh, maybe they do these ancestor simulations. This is Nick Bostrom. Some of you may have heard of him. He's in the philosophy department at Oxford. He's written a couple of interesting books. And what he says is, look, computer power keeps going up. It's going up exponentially. So those of you who are familiar with Sim Earth or SimCity or all these you know, simulation programs know that they keep getting better and better because the computer power keeps getting better. And what he's saying, what he said, what he said about 15 years ago, he said, there's a 20% chance that you're not actually sitting here trying to stay awake and interact with the person next to you, this is all a computer simulation. 20% probability of that. Now, I interviewed him for our radio show. I said, are you Boston? Uh, where'd you get this 20% number? And he, he said, well, I don't know. he said something, but I, I, I still didn't understand. The second thing I said was, well, if this is all a simulation, do I have to live a moral existence, or can I just have fun? <laughs> right? And he, that stopped him for 10 seconds, and then he said, well, Maybe you ought to live a moral existence. I, I don't know why he said that, but he said it. Anyhow, the point is that the really advanced machines, maybe this is all they do. They just relive the past. I don't know if any of you are doing that. You're probably not. But and that's a suggestion. Maybe they build stuff. Who knows? They might consider this problem. This is one problem that I can believe they might consider. This is the universe on a nice day, and it's destined for doom. You know that. It's expanding. It's not only expanding. It's accelerating. Everything is getting farther and farther, well, most things are getting farther and farther apart, certainly over long distance scales. And as a result, the universe is going to keep on expanding and get colder and colder. And, uh, you know, a uh, hundred billion years from now, the last star will wink out, right? Then eventually, you know, maybe the protons decay. That would be a real bummer of a day. 
Or maybe, uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the galaxies turned into giant black holes and so forth and so on. All these are the sorts of things that physics could predict, and they're all bad. Right? The stars are all gone. I mean, in you know, 10 to the 15th years, there's not going to be enough energy to easily collect in any place in the universe where you could roast a marshmallow. Now, if the, 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 the real intelligence in the universe are machines, they see this coming and they say, what are we going to do about it? Because that's the end of the fun. So they might do something about it. Uh, they know I try and change the universe. This is an exercise left to the student. I leave you with this slide that I had uh, earlier today, in which th this is just an illustration of an idea by a guy at uh, Fermilab in Illinois, Dan Hooper. And he says, look, this is obvious. The aliens, the alien intelligence, whatever they are, they're facing the final frontier. Then the curtain finally drops, and that's it. The universe is just getting colder and colder. You can do less and less and less. And consequently, they're going to try and forestall that, keep it at bay at least for a while, by corralling all the stars they can, these big sources of energy. OK, you might buy that, you might not. They will raid nearby galaxies, and even galaxies that aren't so nearby, and grab as many stars as they can and bring them back to wherever they are. Now, I think that there are technical problems with that. You know, I could name some of them, but there are some obvious ones, how you do it. Where do you get the energy to bring them back? And in fact, it seems to me, just a simple calculation, the energy it takes to bring them back in any reasonable length of time is comparable to the energy that they're going to put out in their entire history. So I, don't know, I think there are problems with this. But this guy's no dummy. He wrote an interesting paper about this. And he says, you want to find where the aliens are? You just, oops, you just look for a, uh, a bunch of stars that have been corralled by these really advanced intelligences. This is stuff from science fiction, obviously. But one should, I think. I, I, I don't know that this is right. I don't think it is. But nonetheless, it's an attempt to get beyond the usual thinking of what we're trying to find in space. And if we don't get beyond the usual thinking. I think that we're restricting ourselves to a too small uh, uh, sample space of what we might be able to find. So I'll just end it here. What if we find a signal? Um, most people think this is what happens. The audience, the audience, the audience too. But the public riots in the streets because they can't handle the news. How many of you would not be able to handle the news that we'd found a signal coming from 1,000 light years away? OK, five of you. All right, now, OK. We, you just need to chill. Of course you can handle news. You wouldn't say, I'm not going to classes today. They found an alien signal. Consequently, I'm just going to ride in the street. Uh, <laughs> might do that. I, I just don't imagine anybody's going to do that. But that's the general feeling uh, out there. In fact, this was a uh, photo made in 1997. I think, I don't know if Paul Steffies is in the audience. He is. Paul pointed out to me, this is all very misleading. This is a real photo. I made this photo at 3.30 in the morning uh, at the SETI Institute because we had found a signal that looked like it was the real deal. So everybody was looking at what was coming in on the computers. Now, I thought that this was the fault of a mechanical failure at a radio telescope in Georgia, right? But you know, I, I have blamed the Georgians for this for years. But Paul points out to me that, no, that isn't it. They knew what this signal was. And it's just that the, my colleagues didn't tell me what they knew. Uh, this, this was actually due to the SOHO research satellite. European satellite. So don't blame the Georgians, blame the Europeans. That's, that's a better idea anyhow. But here you see people uh, watching the screens. I made the, the, this photo at 3.30 in the morning. I was very nervous about the possibility this was a real signal. And you know why I was nervous? I couldn't sit down. That's why I made these photos. I was just walking around with my camera taking pictures for something to do. I was nervous because I had a dinner planned the next evening. And I had a luncheon the following week and stuff like that. I'm going to have to move all this stuff. right? You might think that that's really nutty, which, of course, in retrospect, it is. But at the time, that's the kind of thing you worry about. Anyhow, this turned out not to be ET. But men in black did not show up. We thought it was. Men in black did not show up, right? The president didn't call. Uh, the mayor of Mountain View didn't call. I knew him. He didn't call. My mom didn't call. Nobody called. Um, <laughs> until six hours after this photo was made, when the New York Times finally called. They'd already heard about it. So this is more likely what's going to happen. It's not something that explodes the way it does in the movies. It's just a story that slowly oozes out into the media. So uh, I guess the, the, the point of this whole presentation is you know, we tend to extrapolate to the aliens what we are. And that's obviously not necessarily a good idea.
Okay, I'm going to stop here, and maybe you have some questions. You might have any questions? Thank you, everyone. Yeah, is this on? Okay, so we're ready to take questions. Just raise your hand, and uh, Ed or I will come around. Or shout them out in Hungarian or something. Okay. Yeah. I see somebody in the back. You have a question? Okay. Hi, um, I, was, I was wondering why would you look for uh, intelligent life, why would some people look for intelligent life over dumb life, as you call why it? Why would people look for intelligent life in place of dumb life? There's a big advantage in looking for intelligent as opposed to stupid life. Um, anybody who's a member of fraternity may know that. The, the, <laughs> I don't know why I said that, but they didn't have fraternities where I went to schools. Um, <laughs> It's true that microbial life is going to be much more widespread than intelligent life under any reasonable scenario. I think that's true. Unless, of course, you think that the robots are everywhere, which some people do. Okay. But I think the answer to your question is it's some, simply more interesting. Wouldn't you find it more interesting? In 1996, the biggest science news story of 1996 was that Martian meteorite. ALH-84001, that was picked up in Antarctica, and there were scientists at NASA and also at Stanford who claimed that there, were evident, there was evidence of fossilized microbes in that meteorite. That meteorite came from Mars, that's for sure. We know it came from Mars. As Chris McKay of NASA says, there was a brass plaque on the bottom that said, made on Mars. So that's for sure. But the New York Times, which ran big headlines about this find, had essentially no opinion pieces on it. They didn't get excited about it. Stephen Jay Gould at Harvard wrote a not bad piece, and he said, well, I, it's kind of nice, but I would be more impressed by finding intelligent life. You're interested in your peers. You have a natural interest in that. There's some down here, too, Margot. So. Yeah, uh, I already got the microphone, so can I ask the question? OK, yeah. Uh, Dr. Shostak, uh, I wanted to ask you, what is your personal perspective on the Fermi paradox? What is my perspective on the Fermi paradox? It's paradoxical. Uh, I, I don't know if everybody knows the Fermi paradox, but it's very simple. Enrico Fermi, some of you may have heard of the guy. Apparently, this may be apocryphal, but it, it seems that there's truth to it. In 1950, he was having lunch with a couple of other physicists at Los Alamos, and between two bites of a tuna fish sandwich, I said, so where is everybody? Okay. Now, what he had done is just made the very simple calculation in his brain, probably took a microsecond for Fermi, uh, in which he figured out how long would it take to colonize the galaxy. Suppose somebody gives you the job, Ralph, figure out how we can colonize the galaxy. Right? Okay, it turns out you could do that in maybe 30 million years, 50 million years, 20 million years, tens of millions of years, even with you know, rockets that aren't all that fast. The, the real times, you know, the, the thing that sets the time scales more how long you have to let that colony develop before it sends a rocket to some other star system. Okay, but that's the order of the time scale, tens of millions of years. So say 10 to the seventh years, but the universe is, right, it's 10 billion years old, if you, if you will, 10 to the 10th years. So it's a thousand times older than the time required for this little project. So this is like, all right, the Europeans discover America, if you will, right, 1492, and within 30 years, within one generation, there were Spaniards all up and down the coast of the Americas. So that, that took very little time once it got started. And that's the idea here, that you could colonize the entire galaxy very quickly compared to the age of the galaxy. So if anybody was ever interested in doing it, they should have done it by now. Okay, so what's the, what's the prediction there? You should be able to look all around and find, well, there's a colony, there's a colony, there's a colony. And when you look out into space and all you find is nature, how disappointing. You find nature, okay? And so that's the Fermi paradox. How can you maintain that there's lots of intelligence or even lots of life and we don't see anything. Okay. So how do you resolve the paradox? And you know, you, you, there are books written with solutions to the Fermi paradox. One I happen to like that I may have mentioned earlier was the um, urbanization hypothesis, that the galaxy is urbanized. There's some places which are much more popular than other places, and we happen to be in the boonies here. OK, maybe. But there are other things. that It's just too expensive, or the colonies never do much 
Because think of, you know, Britain colonizes Australia. And 200 years later, Australia wants to be independent of Britain, right? That kind of thing. So maybe the colonies go their own way and they don't continue the project. I mean, there are lots of explanations. They're mostly sociological. The only ones that depend on a little bit of science or engineering are the ones that say, work out how much energy is required to colonize a galaxy and ask yourself, wouldn't it be better to develop a better smartphone or something like that? But it has to apply to all the societies that have ever sprung up in the galaxy to be a, a good, uh, good response. And nobody knows. If you come up with a solution, let me know. What about another perspective on the same problem, Dr. Schorstein? You were talking about the uh, Moore's law before, right? How, uh, how the computing power and, and, and basically information technologies doubles each year and a half. Uh, wouldn't that lead advanced civilizations to send radio waves or just signals or <coughs> use amounts of energy so vast that in the end we would be able to, uh, to detect them even if we only look for them in, in narrow bands? Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand. Why would we not be able to detect them? To detect them with radio telescopes, that is. But why not? Because, the, uh, because maybe they would be emitting radiation in many different uh, spectra due to the amount of activities they do, due to the amount of energy they consume, et cetera. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure that I still didn't understand your question. I mean, you could, you could argue that they don't send signals into space for various reasons. They might not be interested. In the case of synthetic intelligence, it may have absolutely no motivation to broadcast its, its presence. It may be also the case, as some people like to say, that it's dangerous to advertise your presence. There are people who are very much against us broadcasting anything deliberately into space on the assumption that, well, you don't want to alert whatever's out there that we're here. You don't know that they're friendly or whatever it is, right? Sound like, <laughs> sound like a president of ours. Right? That, you know, that that might be a dangerous thing to do. Maybe it is, but that's alien sociology. And all I can say to that is that our data set for alien sociology is sparse. I said that in the colloquium. So uh, we don't know anything about that. And I don't, I don't know that you can draw any conclusions. Um, you mentioned the James Webb Space Telescope. And I was just wondering, is there anything in particular that you would get really, really excited about if the telescope found it? Well, I, is, oh, is there anything I would really get excited about if a telescope found it? <laughs> the, or specifically the JWS. The James, Webb, the James Webb Space Telescope. <laughs> well, obviously, if James Webb were to find some evidence of biology elsewhere, that would be exciting. It's not intelligent necessarily. In fact, the chances are it's not, right, just on the basis of time scale. We've had, you know, life on the planet for 4 billion years, and only 300,000 years have we had Homo sapiens, and only, you know, 70 years have we had high frequency, high power transmitters that could communicate. But if you did find biology, at least you would answer an important question. And that is, if I give you a million worlds sort of like the Earth, what fraction of them ever cook up life? We don't know that. So that would at least tell you something valuable. That would say, if you find another one, you know how things are in astronomy. There are, <laughs> there are only certain numbers that are allowed for any given phenomenon. Zero, one, two, or infinity. That's it. So if you find two, you're well on your way to infinity. When you find three of anything, that's infinity. Why don't you just ask it, because I'll repeat it. Yeah, so, so your premise is soft and squishy created the machine intelligence? Yeah. Did soft and squishy create the machine intelligence? I don't know how any of I mean, you could have machines. I mean, how, would it, how would it come about with yeah, soft and squishy? That's right. So Obviously, the machines are created by the soft and squishy intelligence, just like you're created by fish in some sense, right? Those are some of your ancestors. So then we're looking for methane and, and oxygen for the soft and squishy, and we're also looking for the Right. Waste. The methane and oxygen, I put that into this story because most of my, my colleagues would be upset if I didn't talk about looking for life in the solar system. And that's where, by the way, that's where all the interest and the money goes, because NASA is doing a lot of that work. There are hundreds of millions of dollars being spent every year by NASA, but also the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, Right, that China's becoming interested. There, there are a lot of people who are interested in finding life in the solar system, right? But the number of people that are interested in finding intelligent life, well, maybe you know, the public is, but in terms of the research community, it's incredibly small. Any given row in this room, the number of people sitting in that row exceeds the total number of people in the world whose job it is to look for intelligent life. Okay. 
They're very, very small. And that's, that's a money issue, of course. Yeah. Do, you, do you have somebody with a microphone, Margo? Because I can't see. Yeah, I got one right here. Uh, this is probably like a basic uh, hold, hold the technical. microphone near your mind. <clears throat> it's probably a basic technical question. And I think this might touch on the question that was asked over here. Right now, we're, I think we're confining our detection to RF waves. And I'm just curious, I'm not an astronomer, I don't know, how do we know they're using RF waves? Is that like the most efficient way to send a signal through right. you know, X many galaxies? I'm sure there's some attenuation. Why not X-ray, infrared? What are the, so what sort of, like, why, why RF? Yeah, why are we looking for radio? Yeah. Uh, well, it, partly that's historical, to be honest. We invented radio before we invented lasers, as an example. Otherwise, we might be just looking for laser flashes. And in fact, we do look for laser flashes. There are experiments to do that, but they're not nearly as sophisticated as the experiments to look for radio. I think that's because radio came on the scene earlier. But you know, you could say, well, what about something else? And you mentioned x-rays, right, uh, neutrinos, even gravitational waves, right? Been suggested, I, I talked to Pablo about gravitational waves. That's hard because you have to slam neutron stars together or something like that to make an easily detectable gravitational wave. And that's expensive, and how do you send I Love Lucy that way? Anyhow, you have to keep, you know. So radio does have advantages. Uh, centimeter wavelength radio goes right through the gas and dust between the stars. That's a consideration. Light, visible light, doesn't do that so well, so you have a certain limitation. It could be something other than centimeter wave radio radiation. Paul Steffi's in here, we look for millimeter wave, but that's still radio. Uh, things like, uh, you mentioned x-rays, well, yeah, X-rays may not be radio, but the thing is when you go to high frequency radio, then again, the interstellar medium, the gas that hangs between the stars, particularly the ionized gas in that case, will block it. It's like trying to you know, get a message through a curtain. So you know, there are reasons to choose radio. But every week I get emails from people saying, oh, radio is so old school. <laughs> well, that's true, maybe it is. But on the other hand, the wheel is kind of old school. Right, and yet we continue to use them. And I dare say, if humanity is, you know, sitting around 100,000 years from now, they will still be using the wheel. Right. So there's some things that have lasting value, unless you discover some physics somehow that allows you to beat some of the limitations of electromagnetic radiation. Speed of light being the prime one. Yeah. How over here? I don't know where here is. Raise your hand. Oh, okay. How do you differentiate between life and technology? In your assertion that our future is purely technological, and if we're looking for advanced civilizations, we're looking for the technology, where do you put that division between life and technology, and do you put a division there? Yeah, is there, where's the division between life and technology? You should ask the engineers, see if they have any life. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, in a, in a sense, all we're looking for is the technology, right? But, I mean, radio transmitters don't build themselves yet. Right? So the assumption is if there's a radio transmitter, then there's at least some engineering capability behind that. And whether it's biological or whether it's one of these machines that for some reason needs to send information somewhere else, right, then it's still, it's intelligence. And to say life, life is, you know, I mean, you know what life is. It's just <laughs> complex chemistry. I know most of you wake up in the morning and think, well, another day of complex chemistry, right? That's what it is. Maybe that's why it's so disappointing. Okay, well, but you know, we, we don't care about that. We're just looking for a signal. And we know that this signal can't be natural because of the characteristics of the signal, narrow band, and all that stuff. So that means somebody built a piece of machinery to make that signal. That's the first thing. Is there a question over here? Yes, uh, I think that habitable zone is referring to places where there might be liquid water. Enceladus is not in Earth's, hab I mean, in the solar system's habitable zone, but it's obviously a place that people would look for life now because there is liquid water due to, I guess, tidal effects. I guess my question is, how, for, how, how, how much water, liquid water, do you believe there is in planets in the universe, and what percentage of those with liquid water in your opinion, have life, because all we have is a sample of one for planets with liquid water with life, and that raises the question, is it common or is it extremely rare? Right. Okay, the first part of your question was, uh, what's my estimate for the uh, availability, how much water there is in the universe, in the visible universe? Do you want the answer in liters or gallons? I mean, okay, well, all, all I would say is this, I mean, there's a lot of it, right? It's, it's not very quantitative, but 
three quarters of the universe by weight is uh, hydrogen, right? a lot of hydrogen. If you're in the party balloon business, maybe, um, because the, 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 almost all the remaining is helium. <laughs> but three quarters by weight is hydrogen. And I think either the third or the fifth most common element in the universe is oxygen, right? Because stars make some oxygen. So you have hydrogen, lots of hydrogen, and you have lots of oxygen. So the idea that there might be lots of water is not at all radical. And if you look at the outer solar system, right? These moons, almost all these moons have a lot of water content. Okay? I mean, Enceladus, all right, obviously it has a subsurface ocean. But if you take Europa, for example, this is a moon of Jupiter, about the same size as our own moon. It has twice as much water as the Earth does. And you might think the Earth has a lot of water, right? So water is not a problem. There's a lot of water. And maybe water isn't the only thing you need. I mean, there, you could go to Titan, you know, next week. And that's a moon around Saturn. It has lakes, liquid lakes. But they're, you know, natural gas or methane and ethane. So it, maybe you could do it in some other liquid. I mean, nobody knows. But water is not the problem. There's plenty of water. And the only reason we think water is essential is because, obviously, it, it facilitates the chemistry that, that life is. Right? Those of you old enough to remember chemistry sets, you, know, you take all those chemicals that are in the chemistry set and you throw them on the carpet. Now, you antagonize your mom, but not much actually happens. If you now wet it down with a garden hose, now things will happen. So water is you know, essential for the chemistry. It's, that's all I would say to that. Is okay, it, it, just one last question here from me. Uh, <laughs> don't you think the tidal effects uh, of, of, of the moon are responsible for, for what happened here millions of years ago? I mean, shouldn't you be looking for, for tidal forces as well? Yeah, the, the gentleman points out the fact that we have a big moon, and that may be responsible for the fact that we have such lovely. Uh, biology on this planet and humans and all that stuff, because maybe it stabilizes the spin axis of the Earth. And it certainly does. You should ask the person sitting behind you, Gong Ji here. She does research on that. And she will point out that Mars, for example, has big swings in its uh, orbital tilt, right? And the Earth, without the moon, might have those too. But you know, it might go to 40 degrees. And it might take, how long is it? A couple of tens of thousands of years for that to actually happen, for it to tilt over. And, and you know, in 10,000 years, even if you're a snail, you can get out of the way, right? You can escape this problem. It isn't fatal, it isn't that tomorrow the axial tilt, you know, brings Kansas to the North Pole or something like that. You know, if you're, you're still in Kansas, but it isn't Kansas anymore. Uh, you know, so I, it's, it's very unclear that that would be a, a real, you know, game killer, if you will. I mean, it's not, maybe it's not good. And besides, you know, big moons, yeah. We don't know if they're common or not, but they might not be terribly uncommon, right? There are a lot of moons in the solar system. There are hundreds and hundreds of moons. So inner planets tend not to have them, but still, you know, you're talking about a trillion planets in the Milky Way galaxy, a trillion. That's a big number. And sure, maybe most of them are worth, uh, worthless, but if you were to buy a trillion lottery tickets, most of them are worthless. But in a trillion tickets, there are a lot of winners. <laughs> OK, let's, let's take uh, one more. You know, you, you guys actually have to go to class or something. I don't know. Uh, Margo, you decide who's. OK. Um, so if uh, biological life creates technological life or synthetic life, don't you think there's a high probability that um, biological life would have given it a directive to make planets habitable, and thus it's still a good idea to search for habitable planets? See, the students have all the interesting questions. And, and also, by the way, the ones that you can't possibly answer. Um, so would, the, would the, the intelligent machines receive instructions to turn other planets into habitable planets? <laughs> I don't know. What, what would be the incentive? Right, OK, uh, Mr. Robot, we want you to go out into space, find some planet, and terraform it, turn it into something good. I mean, that would be like me going out to the ants in my backyard. OK, you ants, you're really good at war. I want you to teach those ants on the other side of town how to go to war. I might do that, but I don't know why I do it. So I don't know. I mean, now you're trying to guess what their motivations are likely to be. Can we OK, I'll be here for a while, so if you have any other questions, just Seth, come on down. can we do one last oh, one final last question, question right here? Go ahead. So my question regards um, 
us finding them and then I mean intelligent life or them finding us? Yeah. Which one would happen sooner and what are we doing for that to happen? It's a good question. I mean, you know, what's likely to happen first, us finding them or them finding us? And there are plenty of people who think they've already found us. As you know, one third of the American public believes that the aliens are not only out there, but here, right, uh, sailing the skies in their saucers, occasionally hauling you out of your bedroom for an experiment your mom wouldn't approve of. OK, that would be, that would be really neat. <laughs> <laughs> and I get calls every day from people who are you know, having troubles with aliens. Um, and I wish one of them would have some good evidence, because that would give me job security, right? Uh, I don't think we're being visited. And uh, that doesn't mean they haven't detected us. But how would the aliens find Homo sapiens, right? There are very few ways to do that. You could say, oh, well, they'll just use really big telescopes, and they'll look for the freeway interchanges, right? Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, it takes a really big, you can work this out, it's, you know, freshman physics, how big a telescope it takes to be able to see a freeway interchange from 100 light years. <laughs> That's hard. It's not impossible, but it's hard, really hard. Uh, the easy way to find you is to eavesdrop on the radar, right, or the FM radio or the television. That's the easy way to do it. But we've only been sending that into space for 70 years, since the war. And that means anybody more than 35 light years away hasn't had enough time for the signals of, you know, those early TV broadcasts, for example, or the radar from the war, to, to reach them and for them to respond by saying, we don't like uh, Fred Mertz's jokes on I Love Lucy, and we're going to invade your planet and incinerate it, or whatever they're going to do. So that means nobody farther than about 35 light years hasn't had enough time to find us and then come here and abduct you for those breeding experiments that wouldn't work it would be very uncomfortable. So I, I think that that's such a small distance. There's so few stars within that distance. It might be a 1,000 stars, I think, that I think it's very unlikely that anybody out in space knows about us yet. I think the chances are much greater that we'll find them, because we can pick up signals that were emitted an indefinite amount of time ago. So that's the answer to that. OK? I'll All say right. it. Another round of applause for Seth.